It's so great to see you this morning. Thank you for coming out uh, early on a Saturday. As we said, we don't take it for granted. We all have a lot of pressure, a lot of people asking us to do different things, and you chose to be here with, it, with us. And so we look forward to making it worth it and making this what we hope will be an inflection point as you think through your career. So I have a different task than some of the other speakers. So I am going to be talking about um, one of the things that uh, we are noticing as we talk about careers, a lot of people will, who come after me will talk about how do you craft your career path, what are some of the skills that you need. But one of the things that those of us in this room who spend a lot of time coaching young people about careers are noticing, that you could have all of those things. You could have resources, you can have education, you can have exposure, you can have experience. But there's a lot of people who we walk up to and offer opportunity, and they're not able to grasp it because of their mindset. And I think uh, Nikki, who just spoke here, uh, Dr. Maina, we also have uh, Shiko, who will be coming later, I suppose. And all of these people have been spending decades really trying to help young people rise up to the task and respond to the opportunities and the changing environment that is facing them. And they've all got a lot of experience, but there's only so much you can do, even to get started, if somebody's mindset is wrong. So today we made a decision that we would start with that, and that's the piece that I'm going to take on. And then from there, we'll move on to some of the other topics that are more practical around your career and how you approach it. So as you've heard, I'm Dr. Laila Masharia. Um, some people call me a hope hawker. So you know how you're walking by and somebody's like, hey, be ya, ya Johnny. <laughs> you know, stop, here's something. With me, I'm trying to promote hope. What I'm trying to do is to get people to understand what's really going on, because as we shall see, there's a lot being discussed on social media, in your families, in your environment that's very, very negative at present. And it's very easy to get very demoralized. But what I'm here to tell you is that a lot of this is actually not based on fact. We're actually going to be rolling out a, a workshop series called Factfulness to help especially Africans. The rest of the world, you know, they're moving along. But for me, my mission is really to get Africa's young people to be much more accurate in their understanding of how the world is working, what Africa's role is. And when we say Africa, we're not talking about the ground or the buildings, we're talking about you and what your role is going to be in leading the world. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so today we're going to be talking about your mindset as a foundation before you go into all these other things in your career. Before I go much further, I'm going to give you a big disclaimer. So my disclaimer is that I'm a very happy person. I'm very fulfilled. Um, I've been like this for as long as I can remember. Um, I feel I have more than I need or deserve. And even when I have shocks, because all of us must, right? It can be COVID. I lost my father to COVID. Um, it could be all these shocks that all of us uh, face. But I bounce back, right? And so I'm thinking that maybe together with my career and some of the things I've accomplished, I'd like to share with you what has worked for me. But the reason I'm putting it that way is because this is what has worked for me. So I stopped just short of giving advice because what has worked for me might not always work for you. So the way I want you to approach this conversation is really to listen to some of the things that I share and some of the concepts that I use, some of the tools that have worked for me. And then you take what works for you. You know, when we were growing up, uh, I grew up, uh, at least my shags in those days was up in the Rift Valley. And in those days, we used to grow wheat. And when you have wheat, when you're sorting it before you send it, there's a place you put the wheat. And then there's these other pieces that look like grass. And that's what we call the chaff, right? And that one would be thrown away. So as you listen to me, there'll be some things that feel like they don't fit. They don't fit your value system or they don't ring true. That for you is chaff, set that aside. But it doesn't mean that you ignore or abandon everything else you hear, right? Because there could be some other gem in the wheat that unlocks something for you, something you've struggled with maybe. And today you might realize, oh, it's because I've been thinking about this the wrong way. And it might unlock something that opens up a whole world and liberates you to be able to move forward. So that's how to think about what it is that I'll share this morning. So let's get started. As I said, um, we really want to talk about your mindset. One of the things that we are facing that is quite a dilemma 
is that many of Africa's young people, you've seen the statistics, it takes many people tarmac for five years after they get their degree, those who choose to do a degree. Um, there's people who are saying unemployment is upwards or underemployment upwards of 40 or 60 percent depending on where you're reading. But then when I sit with my friends, especially those who are CEOs and leaders, their problem is different. They're saying there's nobody to hire, where are the people, <laughs> what is wrong? And so what that's telling us is that it might not be that there's no young people who want jobs or that there's no jobs, it's actually that there's a mismatch. And that mismatch is partially in skills, um, what we think of as technical skills, the ability to do the job. But a big part of it, as you've heard, is around soft skills. And this is where we get into this kind of mindset and attitude. So we'll talk about that. OK, so what's our challenge? Our challenge is that you all know, you read the papers, you know something like 50% at the World Economic Forum says 50% of us will need reskilling. By 2025, a lot of our jobs are going to start getting washed out from automation. What you were doing before will be done by an app, <laughs> like ChatGPT. Um, so they're saying the kids who are in school right now will be graduating, that they're being trained for jobs that don't even exist anymore. You've heard about globalization, you've heard about technology, and sometimes this can feel very dizzying. Because as myself, as I sit here this morning, what am I to do with this information, right? Like, do I give up? Do I run away screaming? What, what is the solution, right? And so, we are being told that in addition to globalization and tech and how automation and the cloud and the metaverse, all these things are going to affect our careers, we also have what we've all experienced. There'll be pandemics. There's all these things which were, and, and the globe, you know, Russia fights with Ukraine. And then we in Kenya, our food prices are affected. Who knew, right? And so you, this is what we're calling the VUCA environment. So they're saying there's a lot of volatility, there's uncertainty, there's complexity, there's ambiguity. So what do I do as an individual in a VUCA world, right? That is the challenge. For you, I would like you to be in a position, even if there's a lot of uncertainty and the world is really whirling around you, you can choose to take a path. Remember I said you'll lose people, there'll be hits, all of this will happen, but you can choose a path where overall you are controlling your destiny and you're taking charge of your own future. So what is the opportunity? The opportunity is that as they say, globally, there's a, there's a shortage of talent. You've heard we've said in Kenya, people are struggling to find people to fill their jobs. CEOs admit this. Um, there's some roles that are, just remain unfilled. There's others that are filled by the wrong person, either somebody who's underqualified or overqualified. And these are some of the hacks that people are trying to use to deal with this big skills mismatch problem. We also know that globally, there's a very big shortage of talent. Uh, people are saying that by 2030, there'll be 85 million roles in the tech industry open. That's a huge number. Mm -hmm. I thought that that's several countries. They're saying that number is kind of at 4 million now already, as we speak. Um, so that's a lot of jobs, right? And we have, surprisingly, as Africa, that number of young people who we can offer, <laughs> you know, to bring as a response to this problem. But as you can see, the gap between, the, the way that we fill that gap is, is those vacancies. We have these young people, but now with the internet, and if we can skill up people, we can position Africa as the solution to this big global problem. 40% of the world's young people by 2030 will be in Africa. One in three people by 2100 humans will be Africans, right? So this is our chance, this is our opportunity, but we can sit around and lament or we can start to prepare to fill that space. And this is what we call at ADMI and Accelerated, Africa's gift. We are working and we want you to work with us to prepare for Africa's young people to be the solution to the world's problem. Because other continents are aging, they're throwing up their hands, they're always in recession because they don't have workers and people to push forward the growth of their economies. It's us who will save. It is us who will be the saviors, but we have to organize ourselves and we have to scale up. So that's the opportunity. The other opportunity that's really important to bear in mind is at your individual level. Again, when you listen to the rhetoric, you would think, you'll hear people saying our worst days are behind us. It's not like those days when Africans lived of milk and honey, when everybody knew their place and then there was a council of elders sitting under the tree who had all the solutions. 
And women, even though you were wife number five, you knew your place and everything was, you know, we used to share the child rearing together so we were happy. This is how people talk. You've heard it, right? From time immemorial, Africans were a certain way, right? Now, there's a lot of that going on, and the idea is that even our parents will tell you things are really going to the dogs, right? Inflation, everything is confusing. Culturally, nobody knows where they stand. But the reality, and this is how you become a factful person, is that 100 years ago, humans struggled to get a meal a day. Every other baby you had died. You were always living under fear of insecurity because you were always being raided. We hadn't organized ourselves. Many of us were roving around. We were generally primitive, disorganized people. And I'm not speaking about Africans. I'm speaking about humans. Right? This was the reality. Then what happened is between, there's many things that happened, between industrialization and science and understanding that when you wash your hands, you get rid of germs because people used to see babies dying. They didn't know what it was. So there's science, which you would put as part of technology. There's education in general. And all of these things together with globalization have over time, over the last 100 years, reduced that dire poverty we're talking about that was the default for all of us to less than 10% of humans. It is an incredible feat. And this is something that has happened at taking Africa alongside too. So when people start telling you <laughs> that these are the worst times on earth, my pushback to that is that there has never been a better time in history to be female, to be young, or to be African. This is our time. If my great-grandmother came back and looked at you in this room, they would be mind-boggled by the level of affluence, health, ease with which we live. And even though it does come with its special pressures, we are really living in unprecedented affluence, health, longevity, the fact that we're making it, our babies are coming out alive and living to reach five years old, and on and on. But if we go into abundance and that conversation, it's an entirely different one that we don't have time to talk about today. So for you as you sit here and you see people discussing this, because we'll talk about myths in a bit, it's very easy because it's the environment for you to start to believe what you're hearing about yourself as an African, yourself as a woman, us as a continent. There's people who are touting this idea that we are being recolonized. Those who went through real colonization would be shocked to have you even approximate that kind of thought, right? So that's our opportunity. But as we now grasp this opportunity, I have explained that many of us who are in the work of inspiring young people and preparing them for careers are noticing that even when you tee up an opportunity, because as in the work of mentoring, sometimes you'll work with a young person for a long period of time, you'll help prepare them, sometimes you'll even tee up an opportunity for them, like just sponsor them, right, to step into a space. And what you'll find is that many times people crumble at the last minute because of something that's happening in their own mind. And they become barriers. They can't get out of their own way. And so even as we talk to you about your skills, domain skills, soft skills, all of this, we want to first talk to you about yourself and see what you could be doing that might be creating or at least contributing to some of the negative outcomes that you might be seeing in your life. So the first thing before you move fast, further and go out is that a lot of us you know these days, men are not how they used to be. I'm not making fun of you, but there's a time when, when we grew up, guys, you remember if you were in high school or in boarding school and you went now for those dances, sometimes you used to take us in a bus, we'd go meet some guys, and they used to be stinky, they used to be not take care of the, you know, now, men, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Everybody is smelling nice, they've learned how to dress. They, it's just, I really, the new generation coming up are really going to have a good time, right? So what I'm going, where I'm going with this is that a lot of us spend a lot of time at the gym, you know, on the outward stuff, my CV, how I look, all of this, we're taking care of that. But one of the areas which we're neglecting is your inner self. There's a lot of work and an agenda that you need to really go inside and do your work. Get fit. There's a whole personal life 
your mindset, your thoughts. You know, they always say don't believe your thoughts. There are some people who use the metaphor of a horse, a wild horse, that if you, you're sitting on it as an individual and your mind is just this wild horse and you have to learn to tame your thoughts. You have to get in charge of them. Do not believe them. There are chemicals going around in your head, <laughs> all kinds of hormones. Do not let them tell you. Don't for one minute think it's the truth and follow them to wherever they'll take you. You've got to discipline your mind. You've got to have a rich personal life that you take control of. So as we speak about this, the first thing I would say, and now I'll get into tips, is to first know yourself. This is a famous saying that comes from Greek philosophy. First know yourself. Spend a lot of time really understanding who you are. And when we say this, a lot of us, again, when we talk about myths and the common rhetoric, is everybody is, saying about, is talking about self-esteem. And it's true. A lot of us in Kenya had the experience where every time you put up your head, it's hit down. I remember one of my relatives used to ask me when I acted too scared, like we were, you're getting into an accident, and you go, she'd ask me, who do you think you are? Like, to even be afraid for your own life was supposed to be, <laughs> you know, arrogant, you know? So some of us know these, these experiences, right? Like we, you, you keep your head down because it didn't feel safe. And so what has happened is a lot of us have not invested yet in really spending the time and energy and attention you need on yourself. I'm not saying go around like you're hearing about saying, I just love myself, everything I do is great. No, in fact, where your power comes from is from knowing your strengths and your weaknesses. Know where you're strong. In management now, they're saying that the main philosophy is around strength-based leadership. It's true, statistics show that if I'm nurturing you as a young person, you know, growing up, whenever you had, you know, six A's and a B, your parents wanted to talk about the B, right? <laughs> Nobody wanted to talk about the A. Yeah, so we are saying now that if we want you to move forward in your life, we emphasize the areas of your strength so that you can become better at that. But the big caveat in strength-based leadership, that research, is that you cannot afford your fatal flaws. So remember, we're saying we are going to talk about your A's. We're not going to overemphasize the B's and C's. But on the other hand, if there's an F that keeps coming consistently, you need to pay attention to that. Because they say that there's something in strength-based leadership, in that knowledge that's called fatal flaws. And these are those flaws, and there's only you know five or so that are very powerful that can bring the whole house down. And because we're all adults in this room, we've seen this happen to our friends, sometimes to ourselves. If you're the kind of person who can never, never keep a promise, if you show up drunk first thing in the morning, if you can't stop lying, yeah? It doesn't matter how excellent you are, and we've seen this in some of our most famous singers and celebrities, their lives were destroyed because of those fatal flaws. So take, understand and know your fatal flaws and understand and know your weaknesses. And when we talk about we, your weaknesses, we're going to talk about two areas. So one is what we call the three Bs. Know yourself very well, that's your baggage. Understand your past, understand how it's affected you. Understand what you're carrying around that maybe needs to be shed off. Understand your biases. A lot of us as human beings have biases. You can read up on this. We have cognitive biases of all kinds. And what these things do, confirmation bias is one. Once you believe something is true, you'll notice things in the environment and continue accumulating evidence that what you believe is true. Remember we said your thoughts are a wild horse. <laughs> You've got to tame them, right? So that's biases. The third one is really your buttons, and this one is very important. Your buttons are your insecurities. You've really got to know your insecurities. These are those things that people can use to manipulate you because when they do this thing, you spiral off, you lose control. You either get angry or you get insecure. Maybe somebody gives you, you believe you're not good at maths. As long as they refer to maths, you start to, or it could be English. Maybe for some reason you believe that because of how you grew up or something, you're not fluent in English. When English comes in front of you, you start to deteriorate and the little English you know disappears. I think as humans, we can all relate to this, right? When you're insecure, it, the thing that you're insecure about becomes even worse. The little that you can do disappears, right? So know your buttons. If you have those three Bs under control, it can really help you know when you're going into a situation, such as a negotiation, that this area, if they raise this issue, it makes me weak. 
and you're able to anticipate and be able to bolster yourself in advance. It doesn't mean that at first you'll always win, but over time you will learn to get control of yourself, right? And there's some people who are very, very good at being able to see buttons in other people and can manipulate you. It's not, I'm not one of those people who believes humans are evil waiting to jump on you, you know? <laughs> but it's important to know those three Bs about yourself. Another place when understanding weakness is helpful is understanding when you have a shortcoming. And let me explain an example. There's a part in the Bible where, and I'm trying to remember what verse it is, but there's an area where they talk about the difference between, depending on how a situation is going, you can either send an army into the battle or you can look and assess and instead you send a peace delegation, <laughs> right? So in your life, Try and be a person of wisdom. Everything is not budging in to fight. Sometimes you can survive today to fight another day. Or maybe you need to become an ally of the person that's an enemy because you've assessed your relative strength, all right? So those are two areas in which weakness can help. So one is understanding your weaknesses can help. So one is understanding your inner weaknesses, your three Bs. The other one is understanding your weakness relative to people who might be opponents or partners, right? So that you, there's some people who, you know, as an investor, sometimes I'll talk to a founder because I invest in companies. And sometimes you'll see the attitude with which people come into the negotiation is that they overestimate what they have. They'll say, I have this idea. I'm not going to share it with anybody, even investors, because people will steal my idea and run off with it. And you're looking at this person and thinking, firstly, ideas are everywhere. And it, sometimes as an investor, you've heard that same idea several times in the months before, right? What the strength is in is in execution. There's a lot. You need funding. You need, you need a lot of support. You need, you need people with you to move forward. And you might end up with a part of the pie, but you move forward and you build something big. But if you come in with an attitude that you have everything and that there's nobody who has anything to offer, this can become a real liability for you. Right? Okay, so first know thyself. Then, and uh, the, all we've talked about growing, uh, knowing yourself is really about growing up, right? It's basically about growing up, <laughs> right? Fend for yourself, take control of yourself and your future, and this will be very helpful. The next thing is understand your context. A lot of us are growing up in a way where we are keeping our heads down, and we live small lives. And I talked about Russia and Ukraine, which was a shock, but sometimes you don't understand why are the interest rates going up? Why is there inflation? The headline is telling you this is going to happen, but because you never look at the newspapers or look below the surface or try to ask people, what is this inflation? Why, what is this number that the CBK keeps publishing that everybody's waiting for? What are these government securities? How does that affect me? How does that affect my interest rates? If you're not paying attention to that, you're not ahead, you, you can't understand what's affecting your employer, you can't, affect what, you can't understand what's affecting the, the prices in the grocery store, you're always on the defense, always reacting. So the first thing I say is start to read, start to look at global affairs, understand what makes Kenya work. When people are putting policies, don't get all your news from you know, some random guy on Twitter, right? Like try and understand why things are happening the way they're happening. And it'll help you become a more effective leader because then you don't feel like just a victim of these powers that be, which again puts you in a position where you can be really manipulated. But if you understand that those people who are leading your country or your company or your family are leaders who are balancing a lot of pressures and issues coming from around them and are making difficult decisions with limited information just like you, it might help you have a bit more compassion and wisdom as you plan your own life. So understand your context and the market for your skills. This is really important because as you understand at a macro level, it'll also help you understand what is happening in the economy where your skills might be of value. This is important because one of the mind shifts I would like you to take forward from today is to see yourself as a person that serves clients. And what you want to do is to build a package that responds to the market and you've got to listen very carefully to your clients to understand what it is people need. If you adopt that mindset and you realize that everybody who hires you, whether they're hiring you as a consultant, as a business, or as an employee, employee, they're hiring you for a result. They're taking money out of their own pocket, which they've probably struggled to get. All of us struggle for money. 
and they have chosen to give it to you. I'm giving you 50,000 of my own hard-earned sweat a month. Why is somebody giving you their money? They're doing it for a result. They're investing in you for an outcome. And so what you want to do if you want to take control of your career is to really understand that this person is looking for a result. What is that result? What are their constraints? What is the pain point they have that's making them take money out of their pocket to give it to me, random me? <laughs> that will help you start to craft a solution for your customers. And it'll help you get the mindset that is much more agile and responsive to the market as it is. What happens is that if you listen very carefully to the rhetoric around employment, people confuse it with all kinds of layers. They say this is a family, this is that, this is that. No, no, no. You are being hired to deliver a result. Somebody's taking money out of their pocket to give it to you. It's painful for them. So what you do to make yourself future-proof is to make sure that you're filling their need. If Oprah calls you today, picks up the phone and wants to hire you, it's because Oprah, with her billions of shillings, has a pain point that's making her take something out of her pocket to give to you. That gives you power. It gives you power. Remember that if somebody is talking to you and hiring you, you have power. Now, it's not the power that people talk about, which is, I don't know. You know, there's another way. We'll talk about power in a minute. But this is really about the power to solve somebody's problem. And the more that you pay attention to their pain point and how to solve it, the more you start to build what we call job security. So we all now know that job security, as our parents talked about, is gone. Because that same company that you're hoping will make you secure is facing VUCA, right? They themselves are just trying to keep their heads above water. So what you do to make yourself a bit more secure is to continue reskilling, understand the concept, con uh, understand the context, make yourself agile to respond to what people need, and somebody will always pay you if you're solving the problem. That's how to think about it. Then, when you do that, as you all know, because we're all customers, you know, when it's you on this side of the one who's offering the service, you make it more complicated. But when you're the same person who is buying goods or services from people, we've seen you, how tough you are, right? <laughs> you want value for your money. You want whoever it is, whether it's your housekeeper, whether it's the person that's selling you tomatoes, you want excellence and you want integrity, right? So if they're excellent, they continue to deliver for you all the time, and you know you can count on this person for whatever service or tomato they're selling you, you will always go back to them. If this person has integrity, they could sell you great tomatoes, but if they're always cheating you, you're going to stop. Those are two things. So even you in your own life, think about excellence and integrity. How can I be excellent? How do I make this customer or this employer addicted to me? Addicted to me, right? So that's how to think about it. Excellence and integrity. The other thing is to scale up. This is really important. We've talked of, yeah, what w, uh, WEF is saying 50% of all of us will need upskilling by 2030. Our jobs are going to be washed away or upgraded or just change a lot. And when you ask the workers themselves, they all know this because they say they're feeling, even for their current job, they're feeling insecure, right? I'm not really feeling that I have mastery over the skills that are needed for me in this job and definitely not for the future. So we are all in agreement that there's a problem. So the solution is really to upskill. And upskilling is not what it used to be in the past. People used to say upskilling was really about accounting. You know, you're you at CPA 2, now you're going to CPA 3. Yeah, 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 domain is great. <laughs> Technical skills are okay. But where we're really feeling the pain as employers is really in learning agility, right? Because we've said there's VUCA, so every day for us, we're having to adapt. Uh, things are becoming more expensive. Our customers don't want to pay. And so we're all feeling like there's just pressure for efficiency, pressure to deliver more with less, which is why we're bringing in all these kinds of tools to try and make your work and your role much more efficient. But it's pressure on all of us. So the first thing we all need to agree is that we're not going to say we've cleared school. Cleared, yeah? From now on, we're moving into modular Agile, always taking a course here, always taking a course there, filling in the gaps so that you continue to be the person we talked about, who your employer or your client is addicted to. Whether it's someone online who you've never seen, who you're serving, whether it's somebody face-to-face -face in your community, you're always upskilling. 
The second, so learning agility is the first thing. But the other thing we're really learning is this idea that tech is a different industry. That's no longer the case. If you're in the finance department, you now know that you're always moving from one application to the other into the LMS, into the ERP, because even the way you're doing finance every day is changing to become more efficient. If you're in HR, we're asking you not just to automate what you're doing and to, prevent, to present data to your board in a different way that's much more visual, intuitive. They're asking for information all the time because the board is trying to make decisions on the fly as you know, the dollar is going like this, <laughs> the, the rain is not coming. It's, so they're always asking you, interpret. Tell us about talent. What are our needs? Who do we need? What's going on? And you've got to learn to start to understand data analysis and share it, and share it in an intuitive way, help people make decisions. If you're in HR, it's no longer that you're doing Excel sheets and doing calculations. Now we're asking you, what about employer branding? There's a war for talent. Send out, you know, design something on Canva and put the poster online so that people choose us. There's a war for talent. HR, why are you not also content creators and data analysts? <laughs> you know? So all of us are now in tech. Every field is being disrupted by technology. And you've got to open your mind and start saying, am I learning the latest tech tools in my industry? If I'm a writer and a copywriter, it used to be, or a graphic designer, you take all your time, you make something very beautiful. Now there's Canva, you go there, you find a template, make sure it fits your, can <laughs> you know, your company's colors and we're good to go, right? It's like that. That's how to think about it. And there's no shame in that because that's what we're actually teaching you now when you're upskilling you. It's not theoretical. We're trying to make you more productive. So we're teaching you the latest ways to respond to the needs of your clients, right? So we're all in tech. That's the other shift you have to make in your mind. Okay, so now we've said you're going to understand yourself, you're going to understand your context, and you're going to change your mentality as to one that is always killing up. And you'll hear more about that latter one today. <laughs>